Okay, good morning. Um, let's talk about Caravaggio. And uh, for those of you that were not there uh, last time, we saw his early works. But right now, as you can see by the title, we're going to talk about his triumphal period, which really starts at the very end of the uh, 16th century, when uh, thanks to his uh, patron, Cardinal Del Monte, he's going to uh, start getting some very important commissions. And from the first commission on, he's gonna get others because his art is so revolutionary, so different and so beautiful. Uh, what is interesting is that from all these uh, very large uh, commission he received, all of them are still in Rome and six out of the, the lot are still in situ, so still in the churches. So again, just that the little reminder, we have Caravaggio at the bottom line, that it gives us an idea where he stands compared to people like Michelangelo um, and um, Raphael, Titian, etc. Uh, closer to him are two people that influenced him, uh, Vincenzo Campi, uh, who we studied with in, um, and who he was influenced by, I should say, in the north, and then Giuseppe Cesari, who is also known as the Cavalier d'Arpino, uh, Cavalier d'Arpino, and uh, with whom he studied for uh, a while, and then it ended up in a big dispute, and he left. But he was influential. Uh, he was one of the main painters in Rome at that time. His biography, his, uh, the chronology of his life has been pretty much established in the last 50 years, though they still have discovered some uh, quite interesting um, archivals that talk about him and give us a better idea of uh, his death, for example, but also on all the different problems he encountered uh, during his lifetime uh, he was a feisty guy. He never stepped back uh, in front of danger. And so he was arrested multiple times. And uh, this is really what, what um, if you want to say, uh, went all around his, his lifetime, short lifetime, unfortunately. He was born in the north, in Lombardia, not too far from um, Milan. Uh, his real name is Michelangelo Merisi da Caravaggio, and it was shortened to Caravaggio only. But Caravaggio is in fact the little town where after an outbreak of plague in Milan, his uh, family moved back to the city where they were originally from, which was not city, but the town, uh, Caravaggio. Uh, he studied uh, for a short period of time uh, in uh, Milan with Simone Peterzano, uh, who was a mannerist and who pretended to have studied with Titian, which a lot of people doubt, but he was definitely from around the uh, circles of Titian. After a fight, he decided to leave Milan. He, sold, uh, his, he had lost both his uh, father and grandfather from the plague a few days apart. And so he decided to leave uh, Lombardy, Lombardy and uh, he sold the, what he had, the house and some of the land he had there and decided to depart to Rome where uh, the, he reached Rome between 1590, 1592. And he, he had almost nothing in his name. I mean, he came there, they called naked. Uh, he really uh, was pretty poor, but he was talented and uh, pretty rapidly found a place in the studio, the workshop of the Cavalier d'Arpino, with whom he didn't get along at all. And uh, the Cavalier d'Arpino gave him pretty menial jobs to do in his workshop. He, as I said, then uh, because of the pretty nice early works that he had, he met the Cardinal del Monte, 
who became very fond of his work and decided to take him under his wing and literally, which was a normal thing for a young painter, moved him into his own quarters. He had a beautiful palace, the Madama Palace, Palazzo Madama, uh, in Rome, not far from the uh, Piazza Navoni, and uh, took him under his wing. And he had the, very, the, the Cardinal del Monte was a very erudite uh, person, had a court that was uh, favoring the, uh, the new writers, the philosophers, the scientists, and young painters. And so it is in that environment that Caravaggio lived for many years. In 1606, and I'm shortening it because we're going to go through all the details in between, we will see that he will have to flee Rome after killing um, a man that was not very nice. And actually, we're not sure that he intentionally killed him. Uh, he tried to castrate him and it apparently castrated him and that resulted in his death. Uh, whatever that man that was a real, you know, a real brigand, um, was from a pretty high family and the family got uh, very angry and then decided that they wanted to punish Caravaggio who had just the time to flee Rome and uh, take refuge under the wing of the Colonna family who he was very familiar with. Colonna family was very powerful around Rome, actually in, in many places in Italy. Uh, he, his father had worked for them in Milan and they had some properties south of uh, Rome. He went into these and uh, from there departed to Naples where they had other properties. The rest I'm going to uh, let you learn in a minute because we'll talk about it all the way. Uh, his biographers, early biographers were three. Giovanni Baglione was the first one and the most controversial. They hated one another deeply. <laughs> And of course, the result of that is that what we see in the biography by Baglione, it's all negative. So we can't rely on it. We can rely on him for, for events, but we can't rely on him for character. A closer um, biographer is going to be the other painter, Bellori, and Giulio Mancini, who was probably the closest to him. Caravaggio became very influential very quickly. Painters like the young Peter Paul Rubens, who was in Mantua at about the same period of time, uh, immediately became quite infatuated in the works of, uh, um, of Caravaggio and really uh, was influencing the style of painting with that very strong chiaroscuro. We'll see that next year with Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, Giuseppe de Rivera, who was originally a Spaniard, met him in Naples and uh, went into the tenebrous uh, style very quickly. Of course, the, the heightened sense of drama was copied by Gian Lorenzo Bernini, the sculptor, and of course Rembrandt in the north too was influenced by the works of Caravaggio. Characteristic of his art, raw naturalism. That means that he uh, really, uh, he wasn't trying to idealize his subjects. He was looking at reality. Uh, he tried, you know, whenever he chose a model, he was typically taking them from the street, uh, not uh, a beautiful athlete or a beautiful lady, uh, but people from the street, prostitutes often for women and for men, Sometimes it could be the beggar around the, the corner or um, a car, you know, a guy that was carrying uh, loads. And he wasn't trying to uh, sanitize their face, if you want. When they had a, a wrinkle, they would he would show the wrinkle or the defects or whatever. The sense of immediacy is really important because what he does is, and he, when he picks a subject, what he tries to show is the moment with biggest tension. It's what is the, the highest moment, uh, the peak of the action uh, that he uh, can imagine if it's, for example, a, a Bible subject or whatever, a biblical subject. The play of dark and light is something that is more typical in the North 
than in Rome at that time. We see it starting with Tintoretto uh, that plays, it's also a, a result of theater. The, um, the fact that theater became very popular at that time. And as uh, Caravaggio was a, um, a, a night owl, he would love to be outside during the night. Uh, he enjoyed theater. He enjoyed the costume, theatrical costumes. But also we have to imagine how theater was played at that time with torches and lenses that would illuminate the stage. It was still uh, giving for kind of ghostly figures when you were there because the, the, it emphasized the uh, shadows. So this really gave that radical reinterpretation uh, of uh, the secular and religious subjects. We will see how, again, he doesn't show what has been traditionally uh, made by previous artists. And I'm going to show you, uh, make some comparison so you'll be able to see that. Also, one thing that he does, he decides to completely leave the um, technical uh, tradition of the Renaissance where any painting was prepared with uh, drawings, preparatory drawings, modello, uh, Modelli, I should say, were small paintings that they could submit to the patron to see if he agreed with it. He would paint what is called a la prima, which is immediately paint on the canvas without underdrawing. Sometimes some incision with the butt of the, the brush to just show where the main figure would be. And that's very typical of Caravaggio and it's also going to influence other painters. So as I mentioned, from the, uh, around the turn of the century, he's gonna start getting a series of religious commission. And I'll give you a list here for just what he did. Sorry, I don't know what happened. With, okay. Uh, it's gonna disappear. So he's gonna have, we have a whole series of new churches, so new decoration. It takes a while for the church to be built, but then they need some decoration. And so we have uh, two commissions for Augustinian churches, Santa Maria del Popolo and San Augustino. Uh, two that are really coming from new orders uh, that were founded during the Counter-Reformation. Uh, Santa Maria della Scala for discalced Carmelite, discalced meaning no shoes. So there were people that had no shoes and Santa Maria in Valicella, oratorians, and uh, these were from St. Philip of Neri. Also French clergy, the San Luigi dei Francesi is the church in um, Rome that was uh, dedicated to French people. So there was a whole French colony there. That was the church where most French people would go. And then confraternity, uh, the confraternities had chapels that were that they were uh, in charge of and they, they would decorate. And uh, um, the Palefrenieri, I think I'm saying it correctly, we'll see it in a minute, um, had a chapel in, in the Basilica St. Peter and uh, uh, ordered a, a painting by Caravaggio for that, but it was very quickly moved from uh, St. Peter to a church nearby that also had an altar uh, for that confraternity um, because they thought it wasn't following the normal decorum for the subject matter. And this is something that uh, Caravaggio is going to encounter many times that he wasn't uh, giving the proper decorum to his composition and therefore um, they, he would be, his works would be rejected. Sorry. Um, the wrong side. Okay. So the first um, large commission he received is for San Luigi dei Francesi. Uh, that's um, just beside the Piazza Navona for those of you that have been uh, to Rome. It was the National French Church of Rome and um, actually entitled to the Virgin Mary and Louis IX, Kings of France, who was also canonized. Uh, you can actually see on the, the facade a series of statues that recall the history of France with Charlemagne, 
St. Louis, uh, St. Clotilde, and St. Jean de Valois, so different saints that were uh, native of France. The church was also chosen as the place for sepulture for the higher prelates and members of the French community uh, in Rome, including, by the way, Claude Laura, the, the great uh, 17th century painter uh, who spent most of his career in Rome is buried in that church. In 16, uh, 1565, so the um, a French Monsignor Matteo Contarelli, despite his very Italian name, uh, acquired a chapel in the church. And uh, despite the fact that he died 20 years later, it had not been decorated yet. And it is his descendants who are going to give the commission to um, uh, Caravaggio. So again, the recommendation comes from the patron of Caravaggio at the time, the Cardinal del Monte. And so the contract was signed on the 13th of June, uh, 1599. And this is done very uh, formally in front of a notary because uh, they pro that protected both of them. It protected the people, the, the patrons, to make sure that the painting would come on time with the proper, uh, that was painted by him, if it is in, in this case, with the proper pigments that were of good quality and so on. It also stipulated the price that the painter would receive. And so he could defend himself in case there was a problem. But it typically, the problem was that it was giving a deadline <laughs> and very rarely did painters uh, achieve the deadline. It was often not the case. So uh, you can see on the side, the uh, famous Contarelli Chapel that shows three paintings. And at the first, uh, Caravaggio received the commission for the two lateral ones, not for the central one. So what he had to do is a calling of St. Matthew and the martyrdom of St. Matthew. And these are the two paintings he's going to face. So here is the one that he did on the martyrdom of St. Matthew. This is again, totally uh, away from the tradition, traditional representation of the martyrdom of uh, St. Matthew. Just to give you uh, an idea of the story. Uh, he, he was a, a preacher uh, at that time, he was actually, as you know, St. Matthew was one of the disciples of Jesus. It's considered as one of the uh, disciples of Jesus. And uh, he was uh, told by the king that he had to convince a young woman that the king wanted to marry her. But she had already dedicated her life to the Virgin Mary. And so she could not marry the king. And uh, Matthew told him, he said, okay, come to church that day and we will see. And the king, all oh, happy, says, oh, it's good. He probably has convinced the, the young woman that uh, I'm gonna marry her. And at that time, he uh, made a whole speech showing that uh, nobody could force a young woman who was already dedicated to so on and so on uh, to marry a human being. And the king became so angry that he told one of his guard to kill St. Matthew. And this is exactly what we see at that time. Uh, Matthew is on the, the ground, as you can see. The man is there with the sword, he's going to uh, kill him. And you see the, cloud, the, the crowd around him just uh, fleeing the, that terrible moment. Uh, young uh, cherub is there with his uh, bow and arrow coming from the, the heavens. And then in the back, this is called tenebris, maybe we can come back to it. But in the back is a self-portrait of Caravaggio peeking to see what's happening. As you can see, St. Matthew there is not represented as the uh, gospel writer, but uh, as a preacher, uh, he's dressed with the arm and the chasuble that would be the typical 
uh, cloth, the uh, liturgical cloth for uh, a priest. Tenebrism is the word that we use for a very strong chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro being the contrast of light and dark. And uh, tenebrism is when it's very accentuated. And this is very much the direction that um, Caravaggio is going to take. As you can see, you can barely uh, describe what the background is. It's very dark, but then you have the spotlight colors that uh, light, sorry, that that uh, that really bring out the center of the the, the action. And by the way, it's not unusual to have a, an artist portraying himself into a, a painting like this, which would be recognized as in, sense, in a sense a profession of his own piety, to show that he was a witness of that miraculous moment. As we can see in uh, this uh, x-ray that you see on the right, the painting has been modified uh, multiple times. So you can see that at first, St. Matthew was almost standing, and now he, he, he changed the position. So you can see many figures uh, that he changed. After having painted, he decided, no, I want to, to have them in another, uh, another position. Yeah, that's my this is a, an x-ray that has been done probably in the, I would say, 80s or 90s, yeah, 1990. Yes, they do. They actually, as you can see, they make multiple x-rays that then uh, stick together to have the whole uh, painting. And it's really interesting because it gives us an idea of uh, what you call the uh, pentimenti, so the, all the differences, the, the, the changes that the, the painter has done. This also typically is the proof that this is the original, because if it was a copy, you don't have to have this pentimenti. Yes? Are the lines or that the poles or the squares? No, they the just the squares, you know, x-rays are limited oh, yeah, in size, yeah. and so they make X-ray, 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 and then they stick them together. Um, and I don't see the pentimenti. Are they are they just very, very yes, light? Yes, you look well. Oh, sorry, I didn't show you. The, this is why I didn't change the. It's coming there. You are. Oh, okay. Thank so you. you can see the, the X-ray, and you can see how, for example, the figure on the right. Uh, there was originally a figure with the uh, arms uh, apart. You can see that it has been suppressed in the, the final painting. Also, the position of St. Matthew has changed dramatically. dramatically. Sorry for that. The other painting, and this is uh, one of his famous early work, is the uh, calling of St. Matthew. Very interesting uh, work, because again, it's completely different to the traditional representation of the calling of St. Matthew, which typically happens outside. Christ comes and then designates uh, the tax, um, the tax man uh, to follow him. Here, what he does, he comes into that, that tavern uh, Matthew is sitting down with uh, his uh, uh, helpers, and as you can see, they're counting the money on the table, the taxes that they have been able to, to uh, raise from uh, people. And when from the door comes Jesus uh, next to Peter, uh, as you can see, only part of them see him. And this is a big symbolism. The one that see Christ is the one that are going to believe in him. The ones that uh, completely ignore him, like the, the, the two figures here at the end, 
are the ones that are not going to recognize and are not going to be the believers. So that's, uh, there's always that underlying uh, meaning. So the light comes very, very strongly from the, the right, as you can see, it comes down, illuminates the faces. But there is also a light that illuminates the, the head of Christ. And uh, the, the, the way that he uh, designates uh, Matthew, who responds by pointing on himself, shows, are you talking to me? You know, is uh, quite interesting. And this is going to be an extremely influential paintings. All these paintings um, sometimes were copied but also they were all copied on engravings and that very quickly was circulated around uh, Europe. So what you see there is a very silent uh, moment. As I say, there's no, nobody speaking but they, this gesture. And this is also almost like the rhetorical world where you had to do movements and not so much uh, to emphasize this, the, the, the word, if you want, because uh, from the stage, you couldn't see the emotions. And so very often you find that replicated in paintings. As you can see in the blow up, this is the, the gesture of the hand is directly imitated from Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam. So don't forget, he's in Rome, he's seen the Sistine Chapel. This would have been one of the first work that he go and see when the, the chapel is open. And through the Cardinal Del Monte, he definitely would have had access to it. But it's very interesting how you can see the hand of Christ immediately replicated there with um, the hand of Christ towards Matthew. So very interesting painting because again of that tenebrism, that, that great contrast, the realism of the figures. Uh, also a, a, another um, contrast, and then that go back to that so you can see, is that the figures around Matthews are all dressed up with contemporary clothing, but Christ comes into with an antique uh, way of being dressed. So trying to to show Christ as he would have been into his own period of time. When he finished these two paintings, people adored them and it really made his success. So very quickly, he is going to be asked to paint the central painting in the chapel and that, uh, uh, subject was St. Matthew and the angel. Yes, please, can you turn off your, your telephones? It would be nice. So this is the first painting that he made and it was refused. And you look at it and I'm always trying to say, try when you take that class to take your 17th century goggles you put them on and try to understand the paintings from the time they were made. Traditionally, St. Matthew is a saint. He is one of the gospel writers. He's a very revered figure. And the fact that uh, Caravaggio represents him bare feet, as you can see by his hand, probably barely can read, uh, really shocked people. They see, and I think it's absolutely adorable, the position of the angels there who is really trying desperately to show him what he has to write. And, and you can feel that uh, Matthew is struggling doing it, was very shocking to uh, people. So it was refused. And, uh, but the, what was really interesting is that very quickly, uh, when these paintings were refused, they were bought by connoisseurs who immediately jumped on them and said, okay, that's it. And as you can see, that painting went all around uh, 
the Eastern, Western Europe and uh, ended up in the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin, where unfortunately it was destroyed during the Second World War. And so there is um, Caravaggio having to make a new version that this one is going to be accepted and it's still in place in the Fantaheli Chapel. Uh, and this shows now a much more uh, dignified St. Matthew uh, dressed more accordingly and just uh, receiving the inspiration from the angel that is on top of him. And the absolutely beautiful movement of the whirling um, cross that dresses the, the angel. Before he actually started this painting, he already had received another commission, this time for the Chehazi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo. Uh, this church that had been reconstructed between 1472 and 1477 uh, was commissioned by the Association of the Lombards of Rome. So people from around Milan. Uh, had that church as theirs. You know, these were all communities and they liked to meet. Uh, and church was one way. And I assume they went on after that and had them, you know, lunch or whatever together. The uh, church that you see now was updated by Bernini later on. So just to give you an idea, the Chehazi Chapel is just next to the main altar. And he is going to get for that chapel the commission for a martyrdom of St. Peter and the conversion of St. Paul. And so that was started before he started the last painting for the Contaheli chapel. And here is the chapel. So very interesting to see because these paint, uh, we have the two paintings by Caravaggio. And then in the center, a painter that was as famous as Caravaggio at the very time uh, Caravaggio is in Rome and we're talking about Cahachi and this is going to be the lesson next time. And so the Cahachi, Anibale Cahachi painted this and you can see that incredible difference in style, in color scheme uh, between the uh, painting by Cahachi who is more of a traditional classical type of painter though he's going to renovate uh, in many ways, the style of the Mannerist, but uh, the, the big difference, these are really the two trends that we find in Rome, is the Cahachi on one side, and we have the Caravaggio on the other, and that they are united in this uh, particular chapel. The uh, reason actually for the subject is that Mary was the patron of the church, and Peter and Paul were the patrons of Rome. And so this is why the subject was chosen uh, by uh, this uh, patron. He actually, uh, Monsignor Tiberio Cerasi, was uh, practiced law in the papal court and then uh, bought his way to the head of the treasury general of the apostolic chamber. Uh, and he worked with another of the Cajavaggio's patron, um, Vincenzo Giustiniani. So let's look at the one on the left, the first one painted by Caravaggio. And uh, here we have that very untraditional view of the martyrdom of St. Peter. As you know, St. Peter had, uh, when he was condemned to death by crucifixion, he refused to be uh, uh, to die in the same position as Christ and so asked to be uh, crucified the head down. And this is uh, what we see. But what is really interesting in the conception by uh, Caravaggio is not at all the traditional glamorous uh, muscular figure that we would have seen with Peter idealized by previous by the Renaissance painter. But here what we see is still a strong man, but a frightened man. And this is quite visible. Uh, also, what is typical of Caravaggio, he doesn't shy away from showing people the way they are. Look at the dirty feet 
of the guy who is um, uh, working on, on elevating the cross. Uh, also, you, you see the just, the, as I say, frightened figure of that older man uh, who is, knows that he is reaching uh, the end of his life and is going to suffer uh, pretty much uh, until he dies. Also what um, um, Caravaggio does, it brings the subject very close to you. So you cannot just start wandering around the painting to avoid even if something is painful, but he put it so much in our face that we, we are very much faced with the, the, the action. That's the face of one of these torturers. And then the face of Peter is very frightened. In the sense, uh, this would have been, for example, a very typical traditional way of representing uh, a, uh, a painting. And this is what we'll see. Um, that this would be the uh, Renaissance approach uh, to the conversion of simple. A uh, lot of noise, a lot of people around him. He's on the ground. There is the uh, hand of Christ from uh, that comes from heaven and is uh, telling him to believe in him instead of uh, Mark, you know, of uh, going around and, and uh, killing the, the Christian. So this would have been what you call a traditional representation of uh, the conversion of St. Paul. So when Caravaggio did his first version for the conversion of St. Paul, this is what he came about, uh, showing uh, Paul barely dressed, uh, some people there, but no Christ, no figure of Christ. It was kind of confusing for people. They did not uh, like what he was, uh, what he had done. And again, that was refused uh, by the, the patron. And then he made the second version, which is the very famous uh, conversion of St. Paul, which is absolutely extraordinary, uh, but uh, still untraditional, because what do we see first is the horse and not the best part of the horse, the back, the back end of the, of the horse. But it's absolutely extraordinary. And then it's by the light, through the light we go down and we see, uh, Paul on his back, uh, arms apart and responding to that voice and that light that he's seen in the sky that we can't see. So we can only guess that representation. So what is interesting, he was asked, you know, why giving such a prominent place to the horse? And he says, but he's seeing the light too. <laughs> so that was his answer. But it's an extraordinary representation and it is so isolated and because what you see is Paul there, the groom, we can barely see him, he's holding the horse. But uh, this is that moment that's gonna change Paul's life and we know how important Paul became to Christianity. Is, is yes. the light coming from heaven? Yes. Wow. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. really what, what uh, was you know, said in the Bible is the, or the act of the apostle, I should say, uh, is that you have normally Christ appearing in, in, in the sky and that actually they don't even talk about a horse, but it made sense with the, the uh, title of Paul at that time and um, doing a lot of uh, mileage uh, around the country that he would have been on a horse. But it's only the tradition that brought the horse in, but it was nowhere written. But the idea that, yes, there was that very bright light coming from the heaven and the idea of um, uh, soul, soul, why do you persecute me? That was the word of Christ. And so uh, from that time, soul converted and took the name of Paul instead. 
and I think you said it before, but it's interesting. Instead of actually looking at an event, it's almost as if you put you in the event. Yes. So you feel like it's almost three dimensional. You feel like you're physically in the. Yes, and, and that's very event. much what he brings in. So the question was the, the, the comment was that, uh, in fact, Caravaggio doesn't make you just a witness, he brings you within the, the action uh, itself. And that's what makes him so efficient, you know, efficient in uh, his new style. Here is a blow up of the figure of uh, Paul. So we often, art historian, have that uh, habit of looking back and what could have influenced uh, Caravaggio in coming with such a, a creative work. Uh, they find that there was a tapestry by Raphael where the position of Paul um, well, is similar. You just pivot him and you have him now with his back towards us. And it's a very similar position, in fact. And there are other people trying to find what, in, you know, what uh, gave him the inspiration for the big horse and so on. So there's so many possibilities. And maybe he just saw a horse one day with somebody had fallen next to him. You don't know. His third uh, big commission for, uh, is for Santa Maria de la Scala, uh, Trastevere. Uh, which was uh, uh, not built for them, but later granted to the Italian discounts Carmelite. So around 1600, the friars built a monastery next door and uh, they were known for making um, herbal medication. And so they had a whole workshop there to prepare medication uh, for the Pope and for others. They had a garden where they, they used to, uh, to do that. So now uh, he is going to receive for that church uh, the commission to make uh, a painting representing the death of the Virgin or better named the Dormition of the Virgin. But for him, it was the death, not the Dormition. At that time, the concept of as the assumption of the Virgin was not clearly enunciated yet. It was not part of the dogma, but it became a tradition already. It was already kind of a tradition. So when the friars saw this representation of the mission of the Virgin, of death of the Virgin, they were horrified because uh, many points. First of all, uh, Caravaggio, to respect the friars who were discounted Carmelite, made all the uh, apostles, everybody bare feet, just to follow what they were doing. But what was the most uh, horrible thing was the representation of the Virgin, who always had been shown very glamorous, even in death. And here, what happens is that he takes as a model uh, one of the prostitutes that he knew very well. And uh, on top of that, probably, uh, looked at a woman who had drowned in the Tiber River and that had been uh, taken out and had that swollen belly and so on. And so he gives that very realistic image of the Virgin as a death woman with, a, as you can see, swollen stomach, uh, bare feet, not glamorously dressed, just as she's an ordinary woman. And this for them was just too much. So they refused the painting. Just want to show you a detail so you can see even better. And it's absolutely extraordinary, extraordinary with uh, Mary Magdalene in front who is crying on, on her death. It was refused, but there was a young painter north in Mantua who heard about it and convinced the uh, Duke of Mantua to buy the painting very quickly. And uh, as soon as it was refused, the Duke of Mantua, uh, Gonzaga, um, bought the painting. And then it was either offered or was bought by the King of England at that time, Charles II. 
And when he got uh, killed, it was it ended up in the collection of Louis XIV and is now in the Louvre. So that explains why it ends up in the Louvre. And then the painting, that extraordinary painting was replaced by a much more traditional uh, representation of the Dormition of the Virgin where she doesn't look dead at all, but ready to be elevated to uh, the heaven. And this is Carlo Sarasini, who was uh, one of the followers of Caravaggio who painted this much, much more traditional representation of the Virgin. It's only in the 1950s that the, the concept of the Assumption becomes part of the dogma, really. So it's going to take a while. So when you go to Santa Maria del Popolo, that painting is not there, of course. It's the one by Sarasini, which is there. The next big uh, commission, as you can see, it's one after the other. Uh, is the Vitrice Chapel in Santa Maria in Valicella. Uh, the contract, uh, he received the contract at the end of 1601 and started the execution uh, in, from, uh, in 1602 and it was going, going to go on until 1604. The founder of the chapel, uh, Pietro Vitrice, died in 1600 and it is his nephew who was in charge and who was an admirer of Caravaggio, uh, already had one of uh, Caravaggio's painting and he's the one who gave Caravaggio the commission for the painting in that uh, uh, chapel. And as you can see there, it is the extraordinary entombment by Caravaggio which is gonna be so influential, reproduced so many times, including by Rubens, who's gonna be inspired by it. So here we are. And what you see nowadays, unfortunately, is a copy because the original was taken by Napoleon in, four, in, uh, 18, in I'm gonna say 1797 uh, during the uh, campaign in Italy. It was a part of the paintings that were brought to France. And then it was sent back to Italy in 1815 after Napoleon was sent into exile. Uh, but the Vatican decided it was not going to let the painting go back to the church. And it's part of the Vatican um, collection now. And it's only a copy that uh, decorates that chapel. Yes. Which hand is that? Uh, the Virgin Mary. It's her hand. It appears there. Jesus, there is not on Jesus. The only the right hand is his knees. You, you have? No, the hand. Yeah, the hand? No, above. above. Yeah. <laughs> that's his. It's the other arm bit. Oh, here. Yeah, that's him. No, this is him. This is this. Oh, it's in John. Oh, it's in John. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of the most monumental painting that he did. And it's absolutely extraordinary uh, in poignancy. I mean, it, again, he puts us really in front of the subject. We don't have a space between us and the subject of uh, the death cries. A beautiful presentation of Mary Magdalene, who is uh, in typical position of grief, uh, which goes back to, to a long time. Mary, uh, who is, uh, of course, grieving too. And then the, uh, the man that carries him, and probably St. John uh, there. The slab of the, the tomb is uh, under their feet. Absolutely extraordinary representation. The colors are just beautiful, a lot of ochres, but then you have that red that brings up that whole scene. It was influenced by his old master, Peter Zano, who made this painting. And it's really interesting to see also himself was influenced by Michelangelo's uh, early Pieta, that is in St. Peter. 
But the whole plasticity of the figures that you find in Caravaggio's uh, is, is just extraordinary because he really conveys the weight of the body. Often when you see that scene of the entombment, you wonder how they carry it because they seem to be doing that with the little finger. But here you can feel the sheer weight of the body of Christ and the effort on the head of that man. Following that, he's going to receive uh, in 1603, the uh, commission for the Cavaletti Chapel in San Agostino, the Hermete Ernet, Cavaletti uh, had died and his heirs are going to give the commission to Caravaggio for the decoration of the family chapel. San, Augusto, San Agostino is not far from the Piazza Navona. Uh, too, so very central. And the uh, commission was for an, an image of Ma the Madonna of uh, Loreto. Uh, either just prior to receiving that commission or knowing he was going to get that commission, uh, um, Caravaggio went very quickly to Talentino, which is a, a town next to Loreto where uh, the tradition says that in the 11th century, the house of Mary was carried by angel from the uh, from Palestine all the way to Loreto, and there is a big sanctuary that surrounds that old, very tiny little house of Mary in Loreto. So that's a, a, a was at that time a very famous pilgrimage uh, to see that and. Um, Caravaggio did, it's one of the few times where he left uh, Rome during that period to see uh, the house of Mary in Loreto. And he makes one of the most touching representations of um, the, the Virgin, showing really again the Virgin as a regular woman. She is not represented in, in the traditional color with blue and red, uh, but just as a, a young mother, with a big baby in her arms, as you can see, very healthy. And two pilgrims that are there have fallen on their, their knees in front of her uh, in adoration in front of Jesus. The painting is also, by the way, called the Madonna dei Pellegrini, of the pilgrims. The model might have been one of the uh, latest uh, friend of Caravaggio, whose name was Lena or Maddalena. But the painting is shown with a lot of affection. It, it's a very beautiful, very soft vision of uh, Mary, the mother, and not only mother of her own child, but mother of all of us. Following this, he is going to receive a commission for uh, St. Peter. And that was for the uh, chapel of the Palafrenieri, so uh, the, the grooms, if you want to say. So this was a confraternity. And he received uh, that uh, commission made that representation of the, the Holy Family. You have St. Anne. St. Anne, by the way, was the patron saint for the, uh, for the Palafrenieri, Palafrenieri. And uh, then you have that figure of Jesus, totally in the, in the nude, uh, who is um, kind of aiming down to see that snake who's uh, swarming in front of him. It was, uh, exhibited in the Basilica for just two days and very quickly was moved to a church that is just uh, within the confine of the colonnade, the later colonnade, because it wasn't built then, uh, the church of Santa Anna uh, nearby. And uh, it was set there uh, for a time. And then when the 
when the uh, Caravaggio had left Rome and actually the last heir of uh, the person who commissioned that uh, died, the next one decided to take the painting at his own place and it became part of his own collection. The image of the snake can be uh, quite disturbing to us, but this could very well represent Satan and indirectly heresy. And we see very often when you see an image of Mary uh, the Immaculate Conception, she's crushing a, a snake under her feet. So this is the connection. So the, uh, it ended up, by the way, the collection of Cardinal uh, Scipione Borghese, who became an incredible collector of Caravaggio. It's, it's again beautiful because of the light you have again that you these figures emerge from the darkness and then you have that beautiful light that bathes them. And again, Mary is shown as a, as a regular woman. She's not uh, there as, as a holy figure a bit distant. No, she's the one very close to us. After these uh, different commissions, or actually not after, during these different commissions, he produced a whole series of other works. And so uh, we're going to go through them. And maybe we're going to take a break right now. That might be the right time. So I give you five minutes. Uh, we can bring the Zoom people there if you want. If you have questions, if you just want to go and have a cup of coffee or a glass of water, uh, just do it. Same thing here. There is coffee at the back with capsules. If you have a problem, you just let me know. It seems like we're at this point in time where they're very influenced by secularism, but at the same time, the church is so strong they still deal with the religious themes, but they deal with them sometimes in a very secular manner. But uh, this was Caravaggio. That was a novelty with Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. And could you repeat the question? The question was that uh, we talk about the fact that the church, seems, the, the, the art seems to be more secular, but the power of the church keeps, of course, the demand for uh, religious subjects that are treated in a more secular way. But that was very much the influence of Caravaggio. Uh, the others are still much more uh, traditional. And it keeping kind of the reminds me of Jeremy when he does a painting. Uh, apparently, the Inquisition mm -hmm. claimed that he was using dogs and dwarfs and, and things that were not necessarily Christian oriented. Uh, no, it's not Christian. It wasn't respecting the word of the Bible. Yeah. And uh, so we, take, we talk about the Veronese and the fact that Veronese uh, was uh, surrounding his, the main figures with all kinds of secular uh, people. Uh, and he had trouble with the Inquisition, as you mentioned really well. But that's the result of the Counter-Reformation. Yeah. The Counter-Reformation had brought rules that were very strict mm -hmm. and that people had to follow. So Caravaggio doesn't break the rule because he doesn't bring in people that shouldn't be there when it's an image of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is the decorum that shocks so much, the lack of decorum. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, it is. It, it, that's why he's going to be so influenced. Jesus raises again. Oh yes, there. No, he's plump. Yeah. You know. I, I have a question. In. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yes. Could you explain again when uh, you showed the the Madonna or well, Mary uh, crushing the serpent, the the snake? What is the connection? I I missed that. 
Okay, uh, hi, John. The question is uh, about the serpent, the connection of uh, the, the serpent and the Mary in the previous image. Uh, it is, uh, serpent would represent probably uh, Satan and heresy. And the fact that when you see images of the Immaculate Conception, you often see the Virgin crushing a snake under her feet. Uh -huh. And so that's a similar thing, but in a much more realistic way, because there is the snake and, you know, he's threatening them. But this is uh, Satan or heresy, and they're going to be crushed by either the foot of Mary or even maybe Jesus. Cool. <laughs> okay, good. Okay curious about the symbolism in that um, painting, the, the martyrdom of, of St. Matthew. Um, so, so some of the people have on 15th, 16th century clothing, and the, the soldier that's ordered to murder him is almost naked. Yes. You know, yes, why, why? that's, you know, it might not have been a soldier, it might have been a slave. Oh, okay. So, uh, is that the symbolism of being, of him being uh, not having any clothes. Yeah, but there's also the artistic liberty there. Uh, as, you know, a naked body was much prettier to represent. Okay. Than somebody in a uniform. All right. And it gave much more uh, force to to the to the painting. Yes, it's a very it's a very primitive figure. It's yes. Kind of short much. and uh, very muscular, super muscular and very. Yes. Uh, Almost that's primitive. probably why he's a slave, because he would have been used to, to hard work. But that whole series of commissions was incredible. And it's fortunate, except for the entombment, that was very, very, uh, very much mad. And that's why it became part of the list of uh, works that Napoleon wanted to bring back. It, yeah, because he had a, he didn't have a big studio, didn't have a big workshop. He moved to once he leaves Rome, he's on the run all the time, so he can't have a big studio. Pardon? No, no, no. He was a man of opportunity. He liked both girls and boys. <laughs> He was working a lot, but that was, you know, it's a huge output for the number of years that he lived. Yeah. yeah, because I'm showing you, let's say, probably, I would say 90% of what he did. Uh, we won't insist on many, uh, but just wanted you to see that. But I still, there are still works that uh, I'm not going to show you. And some that are, there's a lot of attribution that have been made in the last 30 years or so. And not everybody agrees with it. And I would tend to agree with the doubt. So I'm not showing you these. Yes. From yes. whom did he uh, learn to use light like this? Like there's so much contrast. Did he have someone that he was modeling from or inspired? Okay, uh, the question is uh, from uh, whom did he get that uh, technique of uh, dark and light? We definitely from the North, painters in the North had the much more uh, liked that uh, dark and light much more. And we see that in Venice with Tintoretto, but we have other painters that would come because he's in Milan, so the opposite side of the northern part of Italy. But there were um, things that were traveling and some works that would have been visible to him. And so I think it's just a, a tradition that's more from the north, mm -hmm. definitely not in Rome. Don't forget, too, is the climate is different in the north. So whereas in Rome, you have a, a much more regular sun, you know, sunny day uh, in the north, uh, you have a more rainy type of uh, climate. Have, have we seen any of his works that are actually daytime? Like they're all such a, a, a dark background. Uh, no, that's pretty much what he likes to do. And he was working in his studio. He was working with lenses. 
uh, because the, the space wasn't always very big and he wanted to bring these figures close to us. And so he had, we know uh, by some distortion, we know that he was using lenses uh, on many of his paintings mm -hmm. so that he could uh, bring them closer. Okay, let's go on. I'm going to mute my participants there and we'll talk at the end. Are you going to go through about two hours today? No, it's oh. not going to be, it's about uh, 11 30, about until 11 30. But it's too much material, and I can't cut it more than what I've done. So let's go on with um, the works after his big commissions. Uh, this is the supper at. Uh, Am I, I never know how in, you pronounce it in English, but uh, am I used to say in French? So uh, this is the time after Jesus is resurrected. Uh, he meets some pilgrims on the way to Emmaus and um, they don't recognize him. And so they decide to stop at an inn. They sit down and then suddenly Christ takes the breath and breaks it. And that's when the disciples suddenly uh, uh, recognize uh, him by the gesture. And this is the very moment that we see where you have the surprise of these disciples uh, and the astonishment of the innkeeper uh, when Christ is there and uh, where he blesses the bread and the food in front of them. So it's, again, the height of the, the, the moment. It, it picks up that very uh, immediate moment. And then you have the beautiful light that comes from the left. And the different expressions are extraordinary. The uh, movement of uh, one of the, the uh, disciples with that hand that comes to you. It's almost like you're going to get it in the face. It, it's so incredible. Um, and this one who's just jumping from his seat. It, it is so immediate again, it, it's fabulous. He takes again, he goes back into some earlier work that he's done before, the basket of fruits, uh, that first still life that we always celebrate and puts it there at the very edge of the table as it could fall off. No, this is what you would call the okay. foreshortening. This is called the, the term for that dramatic uh, movement, uh, that very uh, drastic um, movement that comes to you. Very difficult to paint, by the way. It's called foreshortening. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to see the complete difference between the different expressions. Very electric. There. And then the still life at the bottom, which is so, so beautifully represented. This would be the traditional uh, supper at Emmaus, where you see a more dignified kind of Christ, very typical. Uh, the innkeeper totally unaware of what happens, and the others with a, a more muted uh, surprise, if you are, but far not as gestural as we see with uh, Caravaggio. And then he's going to produce a whole series of St. John the Baptist, and I put them more or less all together so we can uh, see the difference. This is a commission that he received from the Marchese Siriaco Mattei, who adored uh, Caravaggio's art and really paid big amount of money to, to get some. He actually stayed with, uh, in his palace for a little while. 
And this painting has many of uh, these type of more secular works, even uh, religious works too, but that were not for the large commission for uh, uh, churches, uh, were made in multiple copies, which has been a nightmare for uh, scholars, as you can imagine, because how to decide which one is the original, if the original still exists. Because as you know, we lose so many of that. So this exists in two versions and uh, both versions are in Rome, the other one being in the Galleria Doria Pamphili. So I chose a young John the Baptist uh, that has that, that beautiful torsion of the body and uh, we can see immediately where uh, he got his inspiration from. And this is one of the nudity of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, that Sistine Chapel was the source of inspiration for so many painters. And uh, uh, this is very directly inspired from uh, that uh, in Nudo in the Sistine Chapel. And how do we know it's uh, St. John? It's just because uh, he is accompanied by the, the ram who was a sacrificial victim. And then the grape leaves that you can see uh, there too, uh, that from, from which of course we get the red juice that is to be uh, compared to the blood of Christ. So not a clear symbolism uh, there, but an extremely dynamic representation of uh, the Saint John of Saint John the Baptist, very very young. If you compare to uh, the two figures, though they definitely the movement is uh, similar, you can see how where Michelangelo it's an invention, you would say, so extremely muscular, over muscular, very often. The young man is copied from nature. Uh, two other of John the Baptist a little later, in the round 1603. And these are two beautiful, can very much that, that contrast of dark and light. I, I shouldn't even repeat it. But the, the way you can see, this is a, a definitely a model. You can see the tan line around the, the deck of the, so you know that it was a real person that he painted and not an invention, uh, very tan, the hands too, you can see. And then the beautiful light on the, the skin of the torso and then that red uh, wrap around him. And the more, even more dreamy type of uh, St. John on the other side. And this is to be compared with previous versions of uh, St. John the Baptist, much more formal, more traditional, one by uh, the workshop of Leonardo and the other one a work by Titian. And we feel completely different when you see the, the young bodies of, of the young uh, John the Baptist compared to that formal, very severe figure there. It's quite interesting. Also, um, some works that he did regularly was uh, works based on the David and Goliath. Uh, he did one uh, very early, and this is the kind of in between where we barely see the face of uh, David who is there. Uh, just has decapitated uh, Goliath and is holding his head in, in the hand. That painting was uh, made for a Spanish patron. Um, he was quite known already in Spain because uh, he had influenced um, Ribera and Zurbahan so, so much. So th there was a lot of uh, talk about ambassadors coming from Rome, etc., that new, young new painter. And so he became very quickly a successful a painter <coughs> for a Spanish patron. <coughs> now, put your 17th century goggle on. 
because this is probably one of his most controversial paintings. And we have to understand it's seen by a 17th century patron. <coughs> this work was done for Giustiniani, who was an incredible personality, a very uh, uh, Renaissance man in the sense that he uh, was able to do everything and uh, interested in everything. What we see in front of us is a, just a young man, very free, as you can see with these wings that, by the way, Caravaggio had uh, borrowed from another painter, uh, Ohatio Gentileschi, the father of Artemisia, uh, that was a prop that he had in his studio. And then we see him with all kinds of uh, props at his feet. What this seems to us, uh, 21st century people, and can be shocking is there is a young man very open physically to us. And uh, uh, we think very quickly abuse, you know, and think of, of a ch child abuse almost in the same, which was not the case at the time because a lot of urchin, urchin uh, young kids were running naked in the streets. We had to realize that in Rome. So when you were going into, uh, the center of Rome, they were kids playing along the river and they were in the nude. And so people were used to seeing these kids uh, going around. So this one, the nudity wasn't as shocking as it is for us nowadays. The idea of Amor Vincit Omnia or, or uh, Amor Victorious uh, comes from uh, a sentence by uh, Virgil. Omnia vincit amor and nos cedamus amor, he loved conquers all. Let us all yield to love. Uh, and this is, uh, in a sense, again, a very intellectual concept uh, that was requested by Giustiniani, where he uh, wants the amor to show all the things that he has conquered. And what we can see is, first of all, the family of Justiniani had ruled Chios, the uh, Greek island, until it's captured by the Turks in 1622. Uh, and so uh, this is the idea of the coronet. You have this little crown there. Uh, that is just a sign that they were the ruler of the island. The Marchese also wrote about music and painting, and that's why we have hands and musical instrument and manuscripts at the bottom. He was also constructing and imposing new palazzo. Therefore, we have some geometrical instrument around. He studied an astro astronomy. There was, that's why there is a uh, sphere. It must be lost into uh, in here. Uh, and then he was praised for his military prowess, so therefore there is an armor. So all the, the, the objects that you see there at the bottom have to do with Giustiniani himself and all this very rich personality. And then you have that young, very free-minded young man on top who is Amor. And Amor was what vanquishes all. This was uh, received tremendously when it was painted. Giustiniani actually had it covered with a drape, not to hide it, but when people were coming to his home, he wanted them to see all the paintings before he would open the drape and, and unveil this painting, which he thought was the most extraordinary of all. But the brother of Giustiniani then asked the rival of uh, Caravaggio, Giovanni Valioni, to paint the sacred love versus profane love. And so uh, Valioni painted this that was definitely inspired, kind of plagiarized, if you want, from Caravaggio. And Caravaggio got very angry. And so that only deepened the, the 
the big hole that separates the, the two artists. Are you showing another? Oh, oh, so sorry. Yeah, I'm. I went behind again for you guys. Here is that painting. So other paintings that he did, this is um, 1603, the sacrifice of uh, Isaac, painted for Maffeo Barberini, um, where he replaces actually the lamb by a ram, and that makes that connection between, uh, it links the Baptist to the sacrifice of Isaac uh, with, in the prefiguration of the sacrifice of Christ. Again, there are multiple versions of this painting. Another of the Supper of Emmaus, much more traditional, uh, even in the, the choice of models, uh, we have a painting that is closer to what would have been the traditional, the muted colors, uh, the, even the still life is by far not as rich as what uh, we saw. That was part of the collection of the Marquis de Patrizzi. And then two paintings about St. Francis. Uh, the one here, uh, two, both uh, St. Francis in meditation. This comes probably from a commission from the papal family, uh, the, the Pope being a Franciscan at that time. And beautiful representation, very, it's so moving because it's so simple, so silent that you can meditate in front of it. And uh, this one also, unconventional representation. But as we said, at that time, uh, he gets really in trouble. On August 1603, Caravaggio is that, no, sorry. He had already been in trouble before and I'm passing all the arrests that he had, is going to. He is arrested all the time because he knocks one down. He, he throws something at the head of somebody else. Sometimes wounds some people. He's accused of libel by Balione, that other painter we saw before, in jail for two weeks and then he's in um, house arrest for two months. But it becomes worse. And on the 28th of May, 1606, he's accused to kill Ranuccio Tommasoni, who was the brigand uh, that, uh, from originally from a pretty uh, high up family, but uh, with whom he apparently had played a, a kind of a, a game of the ancestor of tennis. And uh, it did one cheat or whatever, but they disagreed when that was over. And apparently Caravaggio tried to castrate Tommasoni and he probably died of the wound. Very quickly, the family reacted, wanted him to be uh, condemned to death. And he uh, fled, not direct, and it's not fleet, so it's fled to, uh, not directly to Naples, first to some of the, uh, palaces that belong to the colonas in the surrounding of Rome, but then he went to Naples because they're, they're trying to catch him. Now, once he's in Naples, it's another jurisdiction. The, the, the Italian can't do anything. The, the papal forces can't do anything in Naples because it's under a Spanish ruling. And so he is pretty safe there, though, uh, we'll see there are sometimes some um, gangs that are, can be bought in trying to pursue him. So he flees to Naples. He's been wounded, in the, by the way, during that uh, fight with Tomasini. Uh, so he's taken care of. He paints quite a bit, meets a lot of painters from Spain, Ribera and others. Uh, and um, finally, to escape people that are still trying to, to go after him from Tomasoni, he sails to Malta where he gets a letter of introduction from the Colonna to the night hospitaliers. And he will stay in Valletta for over a year. Uh, 
he gets in trouble again, has to flee to Sicily, where he is going to go to Syracuse, Messina, and Palermo. And then finally, uh, thinking that he is going to be pardoned by the Pope, he goes back to Naples and then will try to go back to Rome. A uh, production of 13 altarpieces during that period of time and dozens of other paintings. Here is the map that gives you an idea. So we had come from uh, Milan, you see Caravaggio not far from there. Here, this is Loreto, so you can see. He had gone once to Genoa, uh, where there was a lot of money too, and so therefore a lot of commissions. Uh, and then he goes to Napoli, from there he goes down to Malta. Then he, he goes to uh, Sicily, first Syracuse, Messina, Palermo, and then back Napoli, and then unfortunately uh, Palo, and then Porto Ercole, where he's going to die. So quickly, the works that he gets in Naples, some very large, um, all to pieces as the seven acts of mercy uh, that uh, were in the church for the church of uh, Pio Monte della Misericordia. The seven acts of mercy were often represented in painting, but not that way. And this is really interesting when you see uh, the way he does. Uh, it makes it almost just a, a busy street where all these things happen at the same time and uh, give you an idea. This was the allegory of Christian charity. So what you have is you have the burial of the dead and you can see just the feet of the dead. That's all you see. But people carrying them with the priest waiting for them. So he's going to go there. Carita Romana was visiting and feeding the hungry and the prisoners. This is typically shown by a woman uh, nursing an old man, so giving her milk to an old man. Dressing the naked, uh, this is the story of uh, St. Martin who shares his uh, coat in two pieces and gives half to um, a poor man. Offering the hospitality to pilgrims is again, you have, uh, oh, I had really went through it, but the pilgrim could be, no, this is in Martin. So here is uh, people that receive uh, the pilgrims and offer them hospitality, which was a very uh, important thing to do. Relieving the thirst, you can see somebody drinking here at the back and then caring for the sick. The person who's on the floor is sick and taken care of. So a new, completely different concept of how to represent this uh, very uh, beautiful representation with muted colors and then very bright lights. Very large scale is that a painting commissioned probably by the Duke of Modena in 1605 uh, and was a start that he started painting it uh, when he was in Naples and this is the Madonna del Rosario. Uh, rem remember that painting, we'll talk a little about it uh, after this, uh, but very beautiful presentation, probably a little more traditional in concept, but a great uh, choice of, of colors with a little touch of red again and beautiful plasticity of all the figures around. Uh, this was for a Dominican church and the Dominicans uh, were the one that really started the, the, the whole idea of the uh, rosary and the use of the rosary. And then Judith and Holofernes, uh, known painting, though it is put in doubt by some, uh, it was commissioned by the banker Ottavia Costa Geno from uh, Genoa, uh, who also had other uh, painting that we saw last time on the, the ecstasy of St. Francis and Mar uh, Martin Mary Magdalene. Uh, it was uh, at that time, these paintings were done when he was with the Monte. Uh, this was 
uh, found actually at the 20th century by Longhi, who became the rediscoverer of uh, Caravaggio. Caravaggio got kind of forgotten at the end of the 19th century. And uh, in the early 20th century, Roberto Longhi rediscovered a whole series of paintings and in 1950 did the big exhibition on Caravaggio and that brought Caravaggio back to the surface. Uh, but as often you have, it just fashion, you know, it's not fashionable anymore and so he gets forgotten. So uh, this was quite discussed uh, and they recognize, in fact, the figure that you see here is one of the uh, figures very often used in that period of time by um, Caravaggio. Her name is Fidele. We know pretty much what, she, what happened to her after uh, Caravaggio left. She probably was his mistress for a while. She was a prostitute, uh, but then became a, a courtesan at a higher level and finished pretty well off. The story of Judas and Holofernes is, uh, goes back to uh, apocryphal uh, writings of the book of Judith, actually. She was a very rich widow in the town of Betulia in Palestine, and the town was besieged by the Philippine, Philipp, Philistines, and um, uh, Holofernes was the general of the, that army. And they, the uh, people in the, the town of Betulia were almost at the end of their uh, food uh, and, and water uh, supplies. And so she decided to help the population and put her best jewelry and the beautiful clothes. And with her servant, Abra, that you see next to her, she uh, went out of the town walls and decided to go to the encampment of the Philistines and introduced herself I'm Judas and I'm here to help you. I want to tell you that the Jews are going to surrender so you don't need to worry too much. It's uh, the siege is over. And uh, she was such a pretty woman. Uh, Holofernes uh, ordered a banquet. He drank too much and then she took advantage uh, of his drunkenness to cut his head. Put the head in a piece of cloth, went back into Betulia and then hung the head outside the walls. And when the soldiers woke up in the morning, saw that they took really fear and left running. And so she saved, she's one of these big heroes that with the help of God, despite her weakness as a woman, she uh, saved the city. <coughs> there is a parallel between David and Goliath and Judas and Holofernes, both weak people, by their use or their gender, <coughs> but with the inspiration of God are able to make incredible things. So this is again a subject that was used quite often. Uh, here it's quite interesting because when you know the pressure you should apply to cut the head of somebody with a sword, she doesn't have the strength to do that. The, the, the way she does it's absolutely no way. But uh, it's quite interesting that, you know, he kind of wakes up, you have the terror in his eyes, you have the blood just going, as you know, from the throat, you would have the character there that would just uh, flow violently. And then you have the beautiful uh, red curtain that is elevated behind it. The contrast also between the old opera and Judas is quite uh, amazing. There is a, a really interesting story about the painting itself. And I know I'm not going over my time, but I think you'll be interested. The painting that you see next to it that has been thought to be another version of the same by either Caravaggio or a painter, a Flemish painter with whom Caravaggio shared a studio in Naples. Both, as you can see, have definitely some similarities. And people think that this could be either Louis Fasson, who is actually a Flemish painter, 
uh, with whom Caravaggio shared at the workshop, that he painted this, or it's Caravaggio. They, they tried everything. The canvases are the same that both painters were using. The pigments are the same that both painters were using at that time. They cannot differentiate even the brushwork between the two. Now, there is a very interesting story about that painting that you see here. Is it was rediscovered in 2000, and I don't want to say uh, lie there, but I think it's in 2014, in an attic in Toulouse, France. And people had a little surprise. Okay, it would have been in that attic for a hundred years. And they found this, uncovered it, said, this looks pretty good. It was apparently in pretty good condition. They called the specialist from Paris. He came, looked at it, immediately said, that's a Caravaggio. They did a whole series of uh, studies on the painting. And then the state of France decided, the country of France decided to put a stop that that painting could not leave the country as being a particular of particular importance. After 30 months, they more or less decided, let's say half of the specialists were for Caravaggio, the other were doubting. And uh, they decided to put the painting up for sale. And so the 30 months had expired. So now the, country, the painting could go up for sale. They made a huge fanfare around that auction in Toulouse. And two days before the sale, an American collector came in and they sold what they call gré à gré, which is in agreement. Before the auction took place, they, they, uh, that American uh, guy bought the painting for an undisclosed amount that is probably around $140 million. Now, a sideline to this, two sidelines to this. First, that guy is on the board of the Met in New York. So it's supposed to end up in the Met. The second thing is that a few months before it was lowered from the attic, the house had been burglarized. And they went away with perfume bottles and a few other artifacts. We're not interested in the painting. <laughs> so this is how sometimes you have these incredible uh, stories of painting. Now to complete the story, this one as well as the painting we saw before of the Virgin uh, of the Rosary um, were transported uh, by uh, by Cajavaggio when he left to uh, back to Rome. And so the, 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 there was a whole story that went on with that one. These were among the few paintings he had with him. So now after they, a lot of stories because many paintings by Cajavaggio have been found lately. So this is a, a crucifixion of St. Andrew, another representation. And I'm not going to go too much into these uh, two paintings of the Christ uh, at the column of flagellated. Beautiful Annunciation. And then, as I say, he leaves uh, Naples to go to Malta where he is welcomed as a hero by the Knights Hospitalier. Uh, he arrived there on June 12, July 12, 1607, and really welcomed as a celebrated artist. Uh, the Knights Hospitalier date back from the crusade. They had started the hospital for pilgrims in uh, Jerusalem, and then when they were expulsed, uh, they were, well, first went to Rhodes and then to Malta. Received by the, the um, head, the Grand Master of the Knights, I love the Vignacourt, which made a portrait here. 
And then he very quickly received some uh, commission for the church and the, the capital of Malta is, in, is uh, Valletta. And so this is the cathedral, St. John. And you can see the painting uh, at, in that side chapel. That is the acclimated uh, beheading of St. John the Baptist. Very interesting composition again, where uh, he shows it just in front of the door of the prison where uh, just the moment where John uh, is beheaded, you have two people that are within the prison who look through the window. And then uh, you have the dish already ready to put the head of John so that it can be displayed, shown to Herod and to Salome. It's beautiful. It's one of the rare works signed by Caravaggio where he signs it with the blood of St. John. On the, on the floor. A very odd representation of sleeping Cupid. You can barely guess the wings there, they're the same props that he had used uh, before. But he's not a pretty little Cupid, he's a kind of plump with the older guy. Salome with the head of uh, Jean de Baptiste. That painting actually was made back when he was in Naples and he sent it to Alec de Vignacourt to apologize for the trouble he had put him in. They are so happy about what he had done that he, they made him a knight. And he was very happy to be a knight because he always was wearing a sword that he was not allowed to wear. That the, to bear because you couldn't bear arms unless you had a certain title. And he was always bearing a sword. So he got in trouble with one of the knights and was in prison, put in the dungeon and he escaped from there and then uh, went, uh, had to flee to Sicily, which wasn't too far. And where he had an old friend that was living a, a young painter. And so later on, he made that painting in Naples that he sent back to him. And so in Sicily, uh, he's there. And again, he is known painter. He's going to make uh, a few works, including this one that unfortunately is in very bad shape. It's the burial of St. Lucy, uh, showing people uh, digging the hole. Here's Lucy uh, that is on the ground uh, with people praying around her. In moves from Syracuse are very quickly to uh, Messina uh, because again, he was in trouble in Syracuse. He's in trouble all the time. And he's asked there to make a painting of the raising of Lazarus. And it's really interesting, he uses the same figure of Christ that in St. Matthew, but he turns it around. And then he apparently had asked for somebody to unearth a body that had been buried not too long ago that was still in Higor Mortis. And uh, this is what he shows as being Lazarus getting out of the tomb where indeed he would have been in Higor Mortis. The Adoration of the Shepherd, this was done still in Messina for the Franciscan, the Capuchin Franciscan in 1609. And then again, he's in trouble in Messina and he has to go to Palermo. And in Palermo, uh, he will paint this beautiful nativity with St. Francis and St. Lawrence for the oratory of St. Lawrence in Palermo. And again, then at that time he thinks, you know, I probably should go back to Nabal because I might get pardoned by the Pope. So he goes back to Naples and there is going to paint a few things, but the big problem he has in Naples is that he one day goes to the kind of a tavern, prostitute place or whatever. He goes in and when he gets out, there are people waiting for him or aren't. And he is badly wounded. Now there are lots of speculation who were these people it was definitely waiting for him. They knew he was there. And they, in particular, are going to um, wound him in the face, which was a particular meaning. 
this was a revenge of honor, was known when you were uh, wounded in the face. And they believed that it is probably not Alab de Vignacourt, but the guy that he had, um, I don't know exactly what he did to him, but it, he had hurt in Malta that had sent his uh, band of armed soldiers to, to catch him. He's gonna be so badly wounded that he will need over six months to recover from there. Uh, and uh, is actually going to still be suffering of that when he leaves Naples to go back. Beautiful uh, painting of the martyrdom of St. Ursula. You can see her, the, the Han, the king, there has uh, thrown in an arrow in her breast and she's looking at her breast with the arrow in it and he still holds the bow. And uh, this is how she's going to be martyred because she refuses to marry that savage. The denial of St. Peter really, again, really beautiful use of light to have the confrontation between the woman who tells Peter, but you were around Christ, weren't you? No, 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 I don't even know him, you know, and three times. And then the soldier gets in her face. And, now, and one more of the John the Baptist, very dreamy uh, representation with the ram. And then finally, we don't know what is really the last of the paintings by Caravaggio. This is one of the last, uh, the Caravaggio, uh, the David and Goliath with the, the figure, the, the features of Caravaggio in the face of Goliath. Uh, and beautiful use that kind of disgust on the face of David is just beautiful. But uh, this is when things get uh, really bad. He, his life was unraveling. And so it's still under <coughs> the protection of the Colonna family. Uh, but he's seeking the pardon. And so there is a succession of people who are going to work to try to get to the, the Pope and get him pardoned. And apparently the Pope pardons him. He sends a painting to a customer in Genoa <coughs> and then he packs his stuff and goes on a, a small fagot along the coast of Italy thinking that he goes back to Rome, gets out at a fort, this is called Palo, and he's arrested without any good reason, probably mistake identity. He's put in jail and during the time he's in jail, the ship goes on with all his stuff on, his paintings, his tools and everything. He comes out, he's sick, he probably is still suffering from the wounds that he had. Might have malaria because there was a lot of malaria along the, the coast of, uh, close to Rome. Uh, he also was suffering because they had seen progressively his character was getting worse, probably uh, lead poisoning that was influencing his character. He tries desperately to go and meet the, the ship at Pont Ercole is a little north of Rome. And by the time he arrives there, he dies within a few hours at age 39. Uh, the ship goes back with all his stuff to Naples and it ends up being with the Colonna. But the Knights of Malta suddenly forget that they had uh, defrocked him and decide to send people to the Colonna and take the paintings that they think belong to them. And these paintings were supposed to go to Scipione Borghese. And so there is a whole history where they fight one another. Scipione Borghese will get them three years later, but uh, the news come very quickly to Scipione Borghese that Caravaggio is dead. Now, not too long ago, in June 2010, a series of scholars decide they wanted to unearth the bones of Caravaggio, but he had no money and so he'd been put in a common grave. And they went through the bones of that 
a particular uh, uh, grave, if you want, and try to select the bones of a person of the 17th century and uh, of a certain size. He was 5'7 uh, in size, more or less. And that would have lead content in his bones. And so they claim, and that's about 85% sure, that these bones are Caravaggio's. They made a big thing that became very commercial. And then I just uh, show to you. But this was the end of an incredible mind, very disturbed personality, but they had a tremendous impact on the century that followed. So next time we look at the Karachi family that are the trend. Sorry to have lasted so long, but I had to show you these. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> cut it short. So thank you so much. And if you have any question now, uh, please, you can put the light back on. Give me your question. I'm going to stop the recording. That's the only thing I have to do.